This lecture is going to be on chronic osteomyelitis, which is a problem certainly faced in uh, orthopedic trauma. It's the sequelae of uh, open fractures, sometimes the sequelae of uh, closed fractures treated with internal fixation. Um, it's something that uh, unfortunately can be extremely disabling for patients, uh, can be very difficult to treat, and I think uh, is um, a, you know, a real problem that we're essentially trying to avoid in the first place. But when it does happen, uh, we need to understand uh, what's going on, what are the treatments. Uh, so I hope that this talk uh, helps shed some light on that for you. So one of the things I think you need to consider is that um, when you get chronic osteomyelitis, there's this biofilm, all right? And uh, the bacteria, uh, they are protecting themselves in, a little, in sort of like this colony of biofilm uh, that oftentimes your body cannot see, it's your immune system cannot get into, uh, and this is where uh, bacteria can reside for very long periods of time. Uh, and one of the implications are when you treat chronic osteomyelitis, you need to get rid of this biofilm. Uh, but it can also make detection of uh, chronic or uh, sort of suppressed infection or infection that's uh, subclinical, very difficult to diagnose. Also called a slime layer. But um, either way, I uh, hope you recognize what we're talking about, which is this uh, these colonies of bacteria surrounded by this glycocalyx matrix. Uh, it, they can uh, typically form on implants, uh, you know, plates, screws, inside you know, rods. Uh, they will escape your host defenses, as I mentioned in the last set of slides, uh, and uh, potentially they can uh, migrate a little bit, as shown here. So. It's difficult to uh, to treat these unless you mechanically remove them, and and when you get uh, a host response to the biofilm, sometimes uh, it increases its defensive perimeter, seals itself off. Uh, you can get an abscess. Sometimes you'll get uh, you know involucrum. Uh, this will allow you know it will, you can develop a sinus tract, which will allow uh, intermittent uh, drainage of bacteria, and this is sort of like a like a homeostasis that develops. Uh, you get a little bit of inflammation. Uh, a little bit of pus that develops responding to the bacteria and the body lets it drain out and you get this sinus tract and this is why uh, these patients sometimes can go on for years and years like this you get this sort of you know, equilibrium occasionally you may get some um, you know some abscess or some degree of uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, you know some obvious acute inflammation, so you may get like acute flare-ups, uh, but uh, a lot of times patients just go about like this, uh, go about their business, the thing drains, they put a bandage on it every single day, uh, they take antibiotics, it gets suppressed, but it's never cured because that biofilm and that uh, slime layer is always going to be there. So classification I think you should really familiarize yourself with uh, Cherney Mater classification and uh, this is George Cherney um, and uh, he's done a lot of work uh, on uh, osteomyelitis and has helped us understand uh, what's going on how to think about this how to treat it so this is a very important classification I think if you're gonna think about chronic osteomyelitis so you first break it down into the anatomic types Right? Is it medullary, superficial, localized, or diffuse? And then you also have to consider the host. Is it a normal host? That is the patient. Is it a normal, healthy patient? Or does the patient have some systemic compromise? Diabetes, for instance. A local compromise. Uh, maybe uh, they've been irradiated in the area. Or both systemic and local compromise. Okay? And then type C is a patient who has a significant compromise and the treatment is potentially worse than the disease that they you know would not be able to do better if you were to try and address them so um, what about host compromise well um, these are some examples uh, and you don't always think about these because we don't always ask about them right so uh, uh, hepatic failure uh, malignancy uh, chronic hypoxia, I mean, these are just some of them. Diabetes, we often think about. Malnutrition, we often don't think about. 
Okay, and then local issues, uh, chronic lymphedema, venous stasis, neuropathy, peripheral artery disease, radiation fibrosis. All right, so these are, you should think about these uh, host issues when deciding how to embark on treatment of osteomyelitis. So here are the uh, anatomic classifications, and this is a very uh, important schematic. You'll see this a lot if you read about chronic osteomyelitis uh, from George Cherney's classification. So a medullary osteomyelitis anatomically is, as you would expect, in the medullary canal. This is an example of the tibia being shown here. So for instance, you may uh, imagine uh, in orthopedic trauma, this, this can occur uh, if you've done a rod, Right, and you have a rod in here, uh, rod and screws, and uh, it gets infected, and I have a medullary infection. Okay, uh, treated with cleaning out, reaming out, getting rid of the biofilm, uh, getting the implant out of there, uh, and uh, oftentimes you don't have to debride the cortex, as opposed to uh, the superficial infection, which is kind of the opposite. So the superficial infection is like, uh, let's just say there's a chronic wound here. Okay. Um, and the medial face of the tibia here is, is uh, continually exposed uh, to the outside environment. So you get this um, colonization here, infection, and uh, potentially uh, you, you'll get infection of the cortex, but it doesn't get into the medullary canal. Now, as opposed to this, you can also see a case where uh, the tibia uh, you know, here's your here's your canal, the tibia, and here's the infection, and you in fact you get this sort of sclerosing that develops, right? So the body responds with a periosteal response. So let's just say, you know, here's a soft tissue envelope, and there's sort of this, you know, chronic uh, open wound here, and the body responds by doing this. Okay, or potentially you may have this small, you know, sequestrum of bone that's sitting on the surface and that's causing this. So you don't have a wound, but you have a sequestrum of uh, dead infected bone here, but it's outside everything and it's, it's or some other material causing an infection, right? That's superficial. Localized, as shown here, is when uh, you have one regional area. So let's just say, you know, this is your, this is your tibia and, sorry for the drawing, but uh, that's your tibia and you know you, your area of infection is pretty much localized to here. There's a sinus tract, um, but the infection gets into the medullary canal. All right, so this is something that you know potentially if you wanted to aggressively get rid of this and you know this area is all infected here, you may need to you know go in to breed this, maybe make you know uh, an oval window here. You may have to ream out the canal. All right, you may have to uh, debride bone. If you wanted to be very aggressive, you would literally chop this out, right? And then put a spacer in here and then maybe do like Ilizarov technique where you make an osteotomy or corticotomy and then you transport this down and fill that defect. Just one example of how you might have to treat uh, a bad localized infection. A diffuse infection uh, as opposed to that example would be uh, you know, you have a tibia, and uh, you have multiple areas, right? So there's sinus tracts here. The bone is, you know, disrupted in multiple levels uh, due to uh, infection. So um, it's more moth-eaten, perhaps, and more diffuse. So here, treatment can be extremely challenging. So because uh, to effectively treat this, by definition, you would have to destabilize the tibia. Okay, with a localized infection, you may not have to. I gave an extreme example where we would destabilize the tibia, but uh, oftentimes this can be maybe treated locally with an oval window, reaming out, cleaning out. Whereas here, it's more diffuse. By definition, you're going to have to aggressively get rid of bone, destabilize the tibia in order to treat it. So, I'll just jump into each one of those. Uh, Again, hematogenous infections can affect uh, uh, or can cause a medullary infection. Um, infection of IM nails is a good example. Uh, these are often treated with removal of the implant, or reaming of the canal, etc. Superficial infection is confined to the uh, bone surface. It can cause this onion skinning, like I showed in my uh, drawing, or what's called a sclerosing Garay type of osteomyelitis, and you treat this with decortication. So, you know, when you treat this, you'd go in and you would sort of uh, maybe burr down um, 
or decorticate the, the sequestrum uh, and then you know, drain this as needed. But you don't have to get into the medullary canal. The localized infection you treat with debridement of the infected bone. And as I said, the treatment could render instability, like I showed with that resection and then having to do maybe a uh, illusor of. You know, so you have to think about bone loss management. And diffuse uh, um, infections, uh, there's widespread cortical destruction treatment. If you really want to get rid of this, requires extensive debridement. All right, so if you have a bad host and you have something like this, you have to think that maybe you know this is you know, not going to work out. Or if you have a really good host who's willing to undergo extensive bone reconstruction procedures, then they can deal with the instability. You put them in a frame or whatever, and you try to reconstruct their bone uh, and prevent it from getting reinfected in the meantime with uh, appropriate dead space management and perhaps uh, again Ilozarov or uh, related procedure can be done. So I think when you're when you're thinking about chronic osteomyelitis, there's some key questions to ask. Um, number one, is there a fracture, and is it healed? Okay, so because you know, the thing is, if you have a uh, old healed fracture that's infected, well, that's stable. Okay, whereas if it's not healed uh, and there's a recent fracture and it's infected, well, now you have mechanical instability. So you 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 know you will you now have an infected non-union which is a worse situation. Um, another question to ask is, is the patient a good host or questionable? And I've kind of already talked about this. And then third thing is, how do you classify this? Because it does help guide your treatment. All right, so I'm going to pause there, and um, we will uh, pick up on the next, uh, in the next set of slides. Thanks.